Hello, uh, welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Round Series. My name is Joe Saramelli. Uh, I oversee Grand Rounds uh, for our department. Uh, this year we've done Grand Rounds all through the webinar format. And uh, today's presentation uh, is the first of four concluding presentations for this year's Grand Round Series. We have a presentation each Friday in June and then uh, the series will end for, uh, for this academic year. Uh, and for today, uh, for today, we have two expert educators presenting, uh, Dr. Anna Rotsliff and Dr. Ty Lostutter. Uh, Dr. Rotsliff is a professor uh, in our department and is the director of the Psychiatry Residency Training Program, co-director of the AIM Center, and director of the Integrated Care Training Program. Uh, Dr. Lostutter uh, is associate professor in our department and director of the psychology internship program. Uh, in the last 18 months, there's been a lot of changes uh, in residency training uh, for psychiatrists and for psychologists. And I think uh, today we'll try to understand what changes have occurred, uh, what changes uh, will persist uh, as more inpatient care, uh, more in per excuse me, more in-person uh, care resumes. Uh, what is the vision for psychologist training and for psychiatrist training? And how can we all contribute uh, to that vision uh, as colleagues? So I'll stop for there and turn it over to Dr. Lostutter first, uh, uh, followed by uh, Dr. Ratzliff. And please write in questions, comments, and I can uh, go through those at the end uh, with the two presenters today. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um... Greetings, everyone. Uh, as Joe said, my name is Ty Lostetter. I am the director and an associate professor here in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, I'm very happy to talk about the uh, psychology internship program. I kind of have a unique perspective on it in the sense that prior to being the director, I was actually a staff member. So for about four years in the department, I started as the, the program coordinator of the internship program. And then part of why I went to grad school was to become a director of the internship program. So this is actually kind of a uh, bucket list thing that I get to check off. Uh, the internship program that we have, that I am the director of actually could not really function well without all of the other supporting members of our group. And so I'm gonna acknowledge some of those. I, my partner in crime is uh, Chuck Bombardier, who is a, uh, the associate director and professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine. And our internship program actually is in partnership with the Department of Rehab Medicine. And so Chuck and I uh, work together collaboratively to oversee all of the entire internship program. And as someone who was a program coordinator, I know full well that a program does not run smoothly without a really good program coordinator. So I want to acknowledge our current program, Cynthia Long, and actually our long history of other program coordinators. If without them, we would not be able to like do all of the things that we were able to do. They keep us on track with the timelines and the paperwork that we need to submit and all of the things we need to do for our kind of regulatory and accreditation bodies to make sure that we have everything aligned and that we're getting all of our evaluations and all of the things that need, all the elements that we need to run a good program are done through our through the assistance and help of our program coordinator. So I want to thank both of them. And throughout this discussion, I will probably be thanking other members of our faculty who help run this program. Um, I'm excited to do this. And actually, I, it just seems to be timely that um, the University of Washington Psychology Internship Program within the School of Medicine actually is celebrating our 60th year of actually training residents. Um, so we were founded in 1961 with the goal of providing excellent clinical, didactic, and research tra training that is firmly um, entrenched in this idea of a science practitioner tradition. And what that really means is that not only are we trying to be good clinicians, but we also try to infuse research about clinical interventions and about therapy and work and use that science to inform what we actually do in therapy and then use our clinical work, things that we're seeing with patients in real time to inform our research. And so this particular model has been a successful model that we have tried to hone here at the University of Washington. While we started in 1961, you have to wait a few years before you can apply for accreditation, but we applied in 1965 and we've been accredited ever since. And so I'm happy to be celebrating this year, our 60th year of education. Um, as I've said, in order to actually run a good internship program, we try to adhere to the educational standards and guidelines 
from different programs or associations that help us actually create our curriculum, tell us what things that we think health psychologists need to understand in order to do health psychology services. Um, so we, as an internship program, are a member of the American Psychological Association. We work closely with the Office of a Program a a Consultation and Accreditation, who provides our accreditation. Um, we also work uh, very closely, and we are members of the Association of Psychology Postdoctoral and Internship Centers, or APIC it is known, which helps us actually and coordinates the national match service that we use to identify and actually have our, our um, applicants from applicants become residents in our program. And we are also a member of the Academy of Psychological and Clinical Sciences, uh, which is a program that is dedicated to, again, this science practitioner model from both graduate programs as well as internships. So I think in order to understand our internship program, which is slightly different from the psychiatry residence program, is to understand that we're a one-year program. So people start our program starting on July, on July 1st, and they end on June 30th. So for us, in order to uh, recruit or apply, what we tend to use right now is our our web, our public facing website that basically every year we review what things that we're gonna be able to offer in training. So we look at rotations that we're gonna be able to offer, the training that we're gonna be able to offer, the didactics presentations, the research training, and we try to synthesize that and provide that at least through our website, a way for to, to recruit applicants who see themselves as having training goals that match closely with what we're gonna be able to provide. And for them, they then actually have to put in an application. They put in one of many applications. So we're actually one of 652 accredited programs that, that are uh, in, involved with a national match every year. So in November, applications are due. We get between 350 to 400 applications every year from those applicants. We are reducing them down through our application review process that is going to get that that primarily is reviewed by different faculty in different tracks, both in our department in psychiatry, as well as rehab medicine. And um, then what happens is we invite or we, we select from those around about 100 people every year to what, come to what we call an open house. And at an open house, they're normally um, given an overview of the entire program. Um, be prior to the pandemic, they would also get to see different sites that they might be working in. They would meet with the current resident cohort. They would meet with postdocs and faculty and have normally around a 20 to 30 minute at least formal interview or interaction with a faculty member of at least three, sometimes more than that, um, during this entire day. So they would come for an entire day. It is a very long day that happens in mid-January. After that is done, we then, as a program, put together a rank order or list and order the applicants for each track that we would like to match with us. The applicants do the same thing. They do all of these interviews or all of these different open houses. They rank order and then a computerized match has to go in at the beginning of February. And then by mid-February, the end of February, the computer spits out the results and tells us who matched with who. And so they basically do this computer algorithm that actually, if we rank someone one and they ranked us one, they would come to our internship site. So that's our application procedures that really kind of drive what's going to happen. So as soon as they get here, since it's a one-year program, we kind of hit the ground running um, because they're going to be done successfully completing the program in about a year, exactly a year. Um, in order to inform our program, we rely, of course, on a structure that primarily is developed around committees. And on each of these committees, our psychology residents work on several of these committees um, to help us have both the resident perspective as well as the faculty perspective. Our first major committee is the steering committee. It's our governing body. Lots of different people. We have a, both a community representative, a postdoc representative, all of our track coordinators, myself and Chuck, are there as voting members. So we review policies, procedures, educational, all committee work runs through the steering committee. So we're kind of the governing body of our educational program. The second most, I would say, pervasive group that we have is our diversity advancement committee. So this is a committee that's near and dear to my heart. I'm currently the co-chair of this committee, along with my colleague, 
Tierra Dilworth, who is a faculty member in rehab medicine and a former psychology resident from our program. Um, the two of us co-lead this group. This group meets at least once a month, if not more. We primarily have aspects in every aspect. So diversity advancement works with the didactics committee, the steering committee, the journal clubs. We help do clinical work. And it was really designed to be thinking about, very forward thinking about diversity. And now, as it has become very aware, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I am happy to say that over the years that I've been doing this, I started as a staff member and I've been now a part of the diversity advancement committee for more than 10 years. And doing so, I've watched this group continue to grow. So our last meeting group was this month and we met and we had 35 people that show up to this meeting. So we have now combined our committee work with also a diversity advancement committee or diversity, equity, and inclusion committee from Mary Larimer's T32. And as a larger group, there are now seven subgroups that are meeting to do these work in diversity advancement in all aspects of the internship program. Our next is our, uh, our didactic committee, which is co-chaired by two different members of faculty, um, Georgiana Seldler and Amy uh, Starsos. Uh, one from our department in psychiatry, another from rehab medicine. They put together the entire year of training and it is based on a lot of APA guidelines and competencies of things we think psychology residents need to know. Each track also has monthly journal clubs that are organized by track and I'll talk a little more about that. We also have additional clinical training in the CAMS, which is a comprehensive assessment and management of suicidality, uh, cognitive processing therapy or CBT, CPT, and also dialectical behavioral therapy, along with other tr clinical trainings that we try to commit to every year. And there's actually an opt-in um, grant writing and research professional development committee that I am also a co-educator on with my colleagues, Dr. Mary Larimer and Joan Romano. And during that seminar, we help residents who come in to actually write um, research grants that they could submit during their internship year or take with them if they submit at some other point in their career, but these are primarily research grants. This year alone, we had three psychology residents submit. Of those three, two of, all three of them got scored. Two of them look like they're gonna get funded. And the third resident has decided to take that, that grant that didn't get funded this year and modify it to be a K award for her next year. So they're all taking products that they were able to create while on internship to help them advance their academic careers or their research careers wherever they go. I keep referring to track structure. So let me also explain that in our program, while we are a generalist program that basically tries to train anyone in psychology on a variety of, of, of any kind of patient that would come sit in front of them in any kind of setting that they work in, we also know that people get specialized in the kind of training that they would like to do. This year, we are lucky to have six different additional tracks that different people are assigned to. So a psychology resident is currently in Autism and Developmental Disabilities, which is led by Dr. Jen Gertz over at the Autism Center, and she also works at Children's. Um, and so I, again, depend on all of these faculty members greatly to help run or oversee our residents in each track. Um, this was our first inaugural year of having the Autism Track, and we're gonna continue having it, so we're very excited about that. Uh, Eileen Tui is actually our track coordinator for our general child track. There are four residents in this track that are currently located at Seattle Children's mostly. Um, our integrated, care, integrated primary care track is led by Dr. Carrie Stevens, who has a dual appointment both here in psychiatry as well as family medicine. And we have a resident in that track this year. Um, our last tracks are the general adult track, who is of course overseen by Dr. Michelle Bedard Gilligan, who's a close friend and um, a member of our department and actually a former resident from this internship program um, and our uh, both behavioral medicine and neuropsychology track. Those, there are six total of seven residents in that particular track, one in neuropsych specialty and the other six in behavioral medicine, predominantly working at either Harborview in the rehab medicine program, both inpatient and outpatient, as well as um, at UW Medicine as well. And that is run by, of course, tr track coordinators are Ivan Moulton um, and Dr. Jeffrey Sherman. So I thank all of them because they do a tremendous amount of work of organizing and keeping our, our program going. I would say the goals of our internship program, as I've said before, is kind of excellent clinical training and supervision to provide the development of, again, kind of the uh, uh, of clinical science and research opportunities and training to infuse the importance of lifelong learning and to incorporate evidence-based treatments in our therapies 
to provide developmental support for, for their professional and preparing them for their next career move. And then finally to infuse to make sure that we are covering ethics and science and practice and the support of diversity. As I've mentioned before, the APA gives us nine current benchmarks or competencies that we need to evaluate and to, uh, by the end of their internship, residents should have met at a very proficient, high proficient level in order to graduate from our program. Those are here, it's research, ethics, individual and cultural diversity, professional values and attitudes, communication skills, assessment, intervention, supervision, and consultation. And so all of these, we have different ways that we evaluate residents. Um, normally we start discussing them as soon as they land on their rotation, how we're going to evaluate them. Midway through their rotation, we do a quick summary and check in and see, are you meeting your competency goals? Are there any things that we need to improve upon using that as individual supervision? And then finally, at the end of the rotation, we, the office, ask for formal evaluations from each of their clinical supervisors to submit back to the program for further documentation that they've met or met these goals or criteria. As I mentioned before, our residents, like all of us now, are spread amongst many different various training sites, and we are very thankful for doing so, but it does make a very complex and um, we are spread out, so it makes it a little hard sometimes to get everyone together, especially during a pandemic. But we have residents at UW Medical Center, both Montlake and Roosevelt Clinic, at Harborview Medical Center, both inpatient and outpatient, and both the departments of rehab medicine and psychiatry. Uh, we have residents at Seattle Children's Hospital and outpatient clinics at Seattle Children's, and we have residents, a resident who currently works at Seattle Autism Center as well. So those are all of our training sites. Who are these applicants? Where do we get them from? Um, and this is actually the part that I think I love the most. We attract a wide variety of applicants from all over the country. These are people who are already completing their doctoral degree in clinical or counseling psychology programs at some other institution. As part of their requirements of their graduate program, they must complete a one-year um, accredited internship program, which is where we step in. So what they end up doing is normally taking a leave from their program, coming and doing their year of internship from us. We verify that they've completed successfully their internship program, and then they're able to, and their home program, receive their doctoral degree in, in psychology. Um, while they're here, we see this as kind of their transition year. So they are most likely they have completed all of their other requirements, or most of them have or at least have proposed their dissertations that they are required to do as part of their programs and will complete their dissertation training before they end this year as well. So some are still working on their dissertations. Several of them, however, have completed their dissertations and this is the last thing they have to do to get their PhD. So during that time, we are helping them transition. So once they are done in our state of Washington, it depends on each state, but in the state of Washington, once they've completed the, our program and they have gotten their doctoral degree, they are technically able to sit for licensure and become a full-blown clinical psychologist in professional training. And that is what we are aspiring to help them with. Um, and again, as I said, most of them come from premier research-focused doctoral programs. They already have, by the time they get to us, around a thousand, hours of clinical work or practicum work. Um, they've been doing this for a while in graduate school, but this is the intensive year where they're gonna spend basically a 40 hour work week um, doing direct clinical work with patients. What do they do as a job description? Depending on the rotations they're on, it varies, but primarily the things that our psychology residents do are they provide screening, assessment, testing, evidence-based interventions, developing and, 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 and working with behavioral management plans. They can do short-term or long-term psychotherapy. They can run group therapy. They provide patient education or family education. They can supervise psychology practicum students, which normally come to us from the Department of Psychology. Um, they provide ex also excellent training for their colleagues. So they work closely with psychiatry residents, medical team members, um, other, other medical students, and medical personnel. And so they're also embedded into large interdisciplinary teams. And what they bring to, I think, a seat to the table is this both evidence-based psycho psychological perspective, as well as doing good clinical work. And as I've said, by the end of their year, what have they completed? So by the end of their internship year, they will have completed 2000 hours of internship. Of those hours are kind of broken up roughly into these areas. 
about 1,200 hours will be of direct clinical patient contact hours, um, 200 hours of formal supervision, which includes at least two hours a week of individual and an additional two hours that can be in some form of group supervision or additional individual supervision. They get 200 hours of formal clinical didactic training and another 200 to 300 hours of their own research release time, depending on whether or not they're doing the grant writing seminar. If they're doing the grant writing seminar, about 40 hours of that is actually a seminar class and the additional time is to help them write their own proposals. And then finally, they have about an, 100 hours of miscellaneous clinical hours, which could of course be experiences, writing notes, um, working on other things and seeing patients or other things. And so that's their 2000 hours. Where do they go or what happens to them? Basically at the end of their internship, what we're able to do is kind of success. Like I said, they could actually sit for licensure and immediately start clinical work if they stay in Washington state. However, a lot of our a lot of other states do require postdoctoral fellowship hours. And so what our program sends, tends to find is that many of our trainees actually go into a either clinical or a postdoctoral research postdoctoral fellowship. Um, and some of them go directly into academic positions. So we've had years where people put themselves on the job market and went back into either official academia or immediately went into a medical center. They've gone into private practice or some actually work in um, public agencies providing direct clinical care. The other thing I wanna highlight is how local they stay. So we are a pipeline for psychologists staying in our state. About half of our cohort normally stays. Many of them stay on postdocs to completely here at UW or in the greater greater Seattle area at the Seattle VA or some of our other sites or at, uh, places that we know here in Seattle. But uh, more than half typically stay here. The people who do leave, they typically leave because they already have other commitments back in their home state or their home program or where their family's located. It is interesting, however, I have watched a trend of some people who've left for postdocs somewhere else and then eventually come back. So we've had a several of recent faculty members who did internship year, left and then came back. I think there's something about living in the Pacific Northwest in the Seattle area that attracts people. And once they've been here, they really enjoy this environment. And then finally, I'm gonna end on what have we learned and where are we at right now? So I will admit that COVID changed a lot of things in our training program. And I am quite um, happy to say that while it was hard, um, I will say our residents and our faculty and our staff have all been very resilient. And I think we should be proud of what we were able to accomplish in the last two years of COVID. So what we were able to quickly do because of, because of what we're doing right now, because of Zoom and other telehealth technologies, and as psychologists, we don't require any kind of physical handling of our patients. Basically what we're able to offer people is a, clinical experience or educational experience using technology. So we moved to telehealth appointments for our patients. Our inpatient work for the first six weeks was paused as we were really kind of learning what's gonna happen with COVID and we were trying to also save PPE. And so we kept our residents at home, partly because they're still kind of students or trainees. Um, but as soon as the protocols were really safe to go back into work, and a lot of our residents wanted to go back in, they were back in the trenches with all of with all of our colleagues back on the inpatient units doing their work. And that's what they currently do. Um, they are back working with patients in the inpatient settings, and the outpatient settings is still variable. Um, but primarily, I'm also happy to say, because I was always highly anxious that that of course I did not want any of our residents to, to fall ill or to get COVID from their contacts. And I'm happy to say that has not happened with any of our current residents. And I am very thankful for that, but it was a stressful year. The other thing we were able to use technology wise was a virtual open house. So we did this last year um, recruit all successfully using a complete virtual world. So we did the exact same almost in-person experience all virtually. Um, it was a long day still, but we were able to do it through Zoom. And I will say where we're headed with this is that we have decided for kind of socioeconomic and social justice reasons, because it's a lot of money to count for having graduate students take their money and come all the way to Seattle to see us, we are moving forward of keeping our open house to be completely virtual. And I base that on research data that we also collected. So we asked all of the applicants from open house this year, what did you prefer? And while they said there are parts of them who did say an in-person would have been nice, they actually really, really did appreciate the fact that they could save money, 
get all of the information they needed about our training program. And they really didn't, they weren't really worried about moving to Seattle or having to see the city. And so we filled all of our slots, which was a worry. Um, we didn't have a gap and we got a very diverse and exciting group of applicants. And so I'm excited to see what next year holds, but we are gonna continue doing our open house virtually from here on out. And I'm excited to see what happens when we build the new facility, the behavioral health teaching facility out at Northwest. I'm hoping to integrate more psychologists into more of those healthcare setting roles. I am gonna stop here and let Dr. Radscliffe talk to you about their program. Anna, if I can turn off my share. There we go. Anna, you're muted. Anna, you're on. Okay. There we go. I think I have it now, correct? Great. All right. So thank you. Um, it, it's really fun to co-present with Ty and hear a little bit about uh, how their training program works. And I am going to share a lot of similar complementary information about our psychiatry residency training program. Uh, I'm, you know, going to talk a little bit about some of the exciting things that have been going on in our program over the last couple of years. There's a lot of updates for everyone. And I will talk a little bit about COVID, but a lot of the things that are exciting that are happening in the program were not necessarily because of COVID. So we'll talk a little bit about changes more broadly. Um, I will, of course, acknowledge that uh, training has been impacted by the pandemic. And uh, one of the things that happens is that we aren't um, necessarily all together anymore. So I have a kind of older version of our residents here on the top from one of our retreats, and then some pictures from some of our mini retreats we had this last year. So uh, one of the things that I think you'll hear throughout my presentation is how innovative and creative our whole uh, residency program has been to really continue to have good learning happen during the pandemic. So I thought I would start by just giving a, bit, a broad overview of what our program looks like right now and highlight a few of the changes that have happened over the last a uh, couple of years. Uh, there are a bunch of exciting things happening, as I mentioned. Um, we have had some opportunities to receive some expanded funding to grow our program from the Washington State Legislature, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and because of that, um, we also have been thinking a lot about our infrastructure for our program and how we really organize all of the faculty and staff um, and resources to support resident training. Um, so I, like Ty, want to acknowledge that uh, there is there are a lot of people who contribute to the training of, of our psychiatry residents. And I want to give a thank you to everyone out there. Um, I see many of you on the call um, as attendees who've contributed to the education of our residents. Uh, I wanted to focus a little bit on sharing a bit about our leadership structure, and uh, I'll do that here. So uh, we have uh, expanded our leadership team as in the last year. So I'm, I'm really excited to have welcomed Laurel Pellegrino and uh, Suzanne Murray in two newly created roles. Uh, Laurel is focusing on curriculum as an associate program director and Suzanne is focusing on evaluation as a um, associate program director. And I'll talk a bit about why that's really important in the next couple of slides. I also just wanna acknowledge that everything I talk about today has been supported by a great team of staff and um, their listeners here, as well as many of our departmental support um, of folks who've contributed to some of the innovations that I'll talk about. And then we have, like Ty, um, lots of other faculty that serve in core roles, leadership roles within our program. And so I want to acknowledge our five site program, um, associate program directors. So Matt Ilshi, Amanda Dabowski, Laurel Pellegrino, Tom Soprano, and Suzanne Murray. So, um, and especially for those of you that are out in some of these sites, those are the local folks who are really overseeing all the clinical rotations along with our chief residents um, at those sites. So uh, we currently have 81 residents in our program. Uh, we have three main uh, site-based tracks, and then we additionally have a research 
pathway that's embedded or track that's embedded within our Seattle program. Um, so currently we have 60 Seattle track residents, uh, 12 Idaho track residents, and nine Montana track residents as we head into the next year. Um, we have some exciting things happening. Um, as many of you know, we have residents who stay here for four years in Seattle for their training, and those are our Seattle track residents. We have had a very close partnership with Idaho um, to create an Idaho track from, for many years now. And um, we are actually quite excited that Idaho has become its own separate four-year program as of this last year. Um, so instead of residents being here in Seattle for two years and then moving to Idaho, they actually will be in Idaho for all four years. Uh, we're really excited that we'll continue to partner with them, um, but the residents will uh, complete their entire training in Idaho. So you'll see our Idaho track resident numbers going down. Um, and then we have a newer track, Mon the Montana track that started three years ago. Um, and there are three residents every year that spend two years here in Seattle and then go on to Montana. Um, so what you'll see kind of over the next few years, and I'll talk about this a little bit at the end, um, is that you'll have kind of shifting numbers of residents as we no longer have an Idaho track here in Seattle, um, but we have actually expanded our Seattle track. So um, you'll see some kind of shifting numbers of residents um, in the different years over the next few years. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is actually talk through some of the key domains that um, how we organize ourselves as a residency program, and I'm going to highlight some uh, important and exciting changes that have been um, that have been going on in the last year or so. Uh, and I wanted to highlight these because I think that it's both interesting to hear a little bit about some of the changes in the program. But also because many of you are involved in training our residents will see some of these uh, changes impacting the way that you evaluate and work with residents. So this is a great opportunity to share sort of a little bit more of the context for those changes that you'll be seeing over the next year or so. So first I'm gonna start with evaluation. Um, uh, as I talked about, I'm really excited that we welcomed a new associate program director for evaluation. And one of the reasons why we think that that is so important is that uh, as part of the learning process, it really is very critical that we get good um, evaluation of resident progress um, and are able to give that feedback to the residents as they're uh, transitioning through their four years of training. And um, we really value all of the input that everyone um, gives us when they're working with residents through those evaluation forms. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the new changes coming around those forms. So um, like Ty talked about that there are core competencies for accreditation for psychology residents, uh, there are also core competencies for um, uh, psychiatry residents. So the um, these are called milestones, and I have an example of one on the top here. Um, this is actually um, our systems based one of our systems based practice milestones, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a second. Um, milestones are actually were introduced in 2015, and one of the exciting things that's happening is that they were actually updated over the last couple of years, and a new set of milestones will actually be the foundation for our evaluation process starting in July of this year. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what that change means and um, some of the exciting things that actually came with that change. So um, milestones, as you can see, actually uh, are a way for us to look at and evaluate uh, resident progress across typically five levels. Um, typically, we expect residents to achieve a level four by the time they graduate from residency. Um, these are really big um, concepts that we should, you know, and big skill domains and knowledge domains that we expect residents to uh, acquire over their residency time and are really an important guide for us to be able to see that residents are making appropriate progress through their training. Um, there are six domains in medical education. Uh, two of those, uh, medical knowledge and patient care, are specialty specific. So that means in our milestones that govern our program, those are actually unique to psychiatry. 
what's interesting and new about the, the new milestones that we're introducing in July is that previously the other four domains were also psychiatry specific. However, in the new milestones that are coming out, these are actually harmonized across all specialties. So um, for the systems-based practice domain, um, the practice-based learning domain, professionalism, and interpersonal and communication skills, those are actually now a sa the same across residents in all specialties. And I think uh, that's going to be a really interesting opportunity to maybe foster some interprofessional um, development because those milestones are now the same. Um, it does mean a big change in the way that we've actually are thinking about and assessing some of the uh, the progress on those milestones because those those really changed quite a bit from being specific to residency to being more generic. So um, you'll see those showing up on some of the evaluation forms. So I wanted to kind of highlight that change. Um, the other thing that I would say that I, has really changed with these new milestones is that we are actually going from thinking about sort of an R1 should be doing level one things and an R2 should be doing level two things to really thinking about actually we want residents to acquire many of these skills early in residency in their first year or two, and then actually be practicing them over their more senior years in the residency program. And that's what I'm really trying to depict in the uh, graph um, uh, at the bottom of the slide, um, especially in domains uh, like quality improvement and systems-based practice, we really want to see people actually acquiring some of those foundational skills earlier so that they have time to practice them with support of their faculty um, and uh, you know co-residents and supervisors. So um, one of the things you'll be seeing is uh, really thinking about how do we assess and make sure residents are actually making that progress earlier. Um, one of the big pieces and things that you'll see most um, quickly is actually that we have all new evaluation forums. Um, so uh, I want to thank Suzanne Murray for all of her work, really taking all of these milestones and with the work groups, and I want to thank everyone who participated in those work groups, really mapping all of these milestones to um, a, a place in our residency training where we can assess them. Um, and one of the things that we did as we did that process is we really tried to think about how can we make this uh, feedback system most meaningful. And one of the ways that we did that is try to make these a lot shorter. So we tried to reduce some of the redundancy in places that we assess milestones, make them more specific to different rotations. Um, and hopefully that allows all of you to spend less time clicking little um, uh, dots on, on an evaluation and actually spending some time giving some written feedback to residents, which um, over and over again, they talk about being the most meaningful um, feedback that they can get. So um, we're excited that those evaluations are shorter. Um, look for those changes coming, um, starting with the evaluations you'll receive after July 1st. Okay, so that's evaluation, very exciting changes, lots of things happening there. Um, I think there's similar exciting um, changes in our curriculum domain. And again, I'm really excited to partner with Laurel Pellegrino in this space. Um, she has been working very hard on an overall curriculum renewal. So one of the things we're looking at is really trying to map our current curriculum um, over this last year, really understand where are we teaching each of the things? Are there gaps um, in things we wanna be teaching residents, um, especially as there are emerging competencies? And I'll talk about this a little bit. Um, a good example of that is actually something that did come out of COVID. So there's just a lot more focus on thinking about the psychiatrist role in telepsychiatry, um, remote consultation, um, thinking about lots of different ways you may function as a psychiatrist within systems. That's really um, evolving as a core competency for psychiatrists, and um, we're really thinking about how can we evolve our curriculum to be able to match that. Um, another big domain that we've been thinking about um, a lot in the last year is equity, diversity, and inclusion in our curriculum, uh, and we've had some opportunities. Some of our residents have really been quite helpful in developing some new didactics that we're integrating into our overall curriculum, as well as this year we hosted our first um, anti-racist workshop, which was very successful. Um, we, you know, were really excited that we were able to bring all of our residents together to be able to participate in that workshop. 
Uh, we also have been doing a lot of things differently in didactics. So like Ty explained, um, due to the pandemic, we had to make a rapid transition to Zoom, um, uh, where um, all of our didactic series and, and most of our supervision and supervision groups have been delivered over Zoom for the last year and a bit. Um, I think that there's been some really interesting things to learn out of that, some places where we're like, oh, we really miss being in person, but there have been some advantages, especially around residents who might be at different sites, not missing some of those didactics because of challenges traveling. Um, and uh, we also have been exploring, can we shorten some of the sessions and have more time for individual study, for example, during that didactic time. So I think, um, and there are definitely some lessons learned that we're trying to think about as we think about what would the new normal look like coming out of this period of sort of forced Zoom di didactics. Um, the last thing I'll touch on briefly is the other big part of our curriculum is obviously all the clinical work that people do. I mean, that's where most of the learning happens is actually out practicing, taking care of patients. Um, I have pictures here of all of our sites. Um, our core training site, so Harborview, Seattle Children's, our two campuses for University of Washington, our Seattle VA, and then of course we have many more community sites that we have residents at um, as well. And you can imagine that um, having trainees across all of those sites um, at, you know, is very exciting and I think offers a lot of diversity of um, opportunities for clinical work. It also requires a lot of coordination to support residents across all of those sites. So really much um, are, are, are grateful for all of the faculty who help us do that. Um, I think the other thing that we've been thinking a lot about in terms of our rotations um, is this piece around um, telepsychiatry and remote consultation. So during the pandemic, uh, there was a rapid transformation that most of our outpatient services actually uh, have been delivered um, via telepsychiatry. And that's opened up a whole new um, sort of area of, of supervision that we've really been thinking about actively as a learning community. Um, especially now as there are options for patients to come in in person. Um, I think we've really had an opportunity to see what are some of the advantages of offering telepsychiatry, but also what are some of the limitations or ways it might create new barriers for patients. And I think there's been some really rich discussions around thinking through how do we um, best offer services to our, our patients and make those decisions about the best modalities uh, moving forward. So I think that will be an ongoing piece of our work that I think really was accelerated um, by uh, sort of forced by the pandemic and not being able to see um, people in person. Uh, and the last sort of innovation I want to just touch on um, briefly is that we have many new R2 selectives. So one of the, the opportunities that has come out of our program growing um, is that we actually have um, a little more room in our R2 year for people to have an elective or selective month. Um, and I'm really grateful that we have amazing faculty that have created all kinds of unique opportunities for residents to explore potential career interests much earlier in their residency um, than we used, we used to be able to. So um, for example, we have a, this new this year, a global mental health elective. Um, we have a population health elective that has been running for a couple of years. Uh, recovery perinatal mental health is new this year. Addiction CL service at Harborview is new this year. Um, and many more. So I think one of, that's one of the other things we've really been evolving is trying to figure out how can we get residents connected to potential interests earlier in their career and training so they really have time to explore uh, potential career options during their training. Um, I wanted to touch briefly on um, accreditation. So um, this is maybe not the most interesting um, topic of, for many of us. Uh, it's a lot of rules that we have to follow, but I'm really excited because this has been an area of real innovation in the last year. Um, and this work has largely been supported by uh, Colleen Himes and Rosemary Whitwright. So I just wanna thank them for their partnership around this. Um, we have a lot of pieces of documentation we actually have to collect to be uh, consistent with ACGME, which is our accrediting body's rules and regulations about psychiatry residency training. And I'm really excited that one of the things we've been thinking about a lot this year as actually shuffling paperwork around has become more challenging is how can we make more of those, that collection of data um, more um, 
electronic um, and have kind of more digital ways of, of collecting that? And also, how do we actually then share that information and progress uh, throughout all of those requirements in the residency with the residents more transparently? And I'm really excited this next year, we're going to introduce a new um, tool to really do that, and that's called our residency portfolio. And I have a screenshot of um, the work in progress that this is looking like right now. Uh, for those of you that are advisors to residents, this is going to be a real tool that you can look at the resident progress together and be able to, in one place, really see all those pieces um, kind of come together. Um, so there's um, going to be places for the individual learning plans, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, clinical skills examinations, personal psychotherapy attestations. So really one, one kind of view to make sure that we can see the progress um, across many domains um, of training. So really excited about that change coming in July again. Um, we also, um, part of our accreditation is that they now, the, the ACGME now really wants us to focus on creating individual learning plans to help support residents through their four years of residency. And so for those of you that are advisors, um, you will see um, our old semi-annual advisor form replaced by this new individual learning plan, um, which is uh, listed there in the bottom. We had some really nice opportunity to do some faculty development on that recently, um, and uh, we'll be sending out lots of guidance around how to fill out these new plans um, as they roll out in July as well. Um, so my last two slides, I just want to kind of talk about future a little bit. So I always think of recruitment as really the future of our program, because that's where we're recruiting our new residents um, from every year. And um, like Ty, um, we had a lot of innovation around our recruitment this last year that was forced due to uh, doing a virtual recruitment. Um, but there are many things that we really learned and liked about some of the things that we did over this last year of recruitment. So I want to highlight a few um, of those to you as well. So the first thing I want to just touch on is that psychiatry has become an incredibly competitive specialty, uh, which I think is very different than when many of us applied for psychiatry that are faculty. Um, you know, at this last year, we had over 1,400 applications um, to our Seattle track. Um, we interviewed about 160 applicants, so thank you for everyone who interviewed applicants and helped us accomplish that. Um, and that's to basically fill our programs, which are 13 new Seattle, in, I'm sorry, 16 new Seattle interns, um, three new PGY2 intern um, residents, and then um, three new Montana interns. So, um, you know, it is a very selective program um, in the end. Uh, like, um, Ty described, we go through a match process. Um, we had a very successful match this year. We got incredible interns coming in. I'm very excited about them. Uh, and I think um, it's just, I wanted to kind of share how big the numbers are um, around our recruitment process. Um, a couple of other things we did this year, we definitely really, um, focused on a more holistic assessment. Um, we did a lot of work around making sure everyone that was involved in the selection process received anti-bias training, um, and we introduced standardized interviews this year. So really thinking a lot, the admissions committee has done a ton of work on really thinking about how, what are our best practices around our recruitment process. Um, and then the virtual recruitment this year. So I put a few pictures from this. So um, this is actually our chief residence um, created this picture, but I think it represented nicely um, what Zoom interviews sort of felt like. So we did a lot of, we did all of our interviews by Zoom. Um, I, it went incredibly smoothly, actually. So um, we like Ty are really thinking a lot about what, you know, probably keeping our recruitment, um, our interview process being virtual, um, especially because it does seem to be, uh, and there's a lot of conversation around this, a more equitable approach for people not to necessarily have to spend um, you know, $5,000 over the time to interview at the 20 places that they need to go. Um, so uh, we're definitely thinking about this. This next year, it is going to be a virtual interview season um, for sure, and we'll continue to think about that. I just want to highlight, if you didn't get a chance, we have some great videos. Um, this is a picture from one of them um, that the residents created to highlight our program. And then um, we also have a new Instagram account, um, and that um, uh, the picture at the bottom there um, are our interns that um, came in, and that was um, a shout out on our Instagram account. Um, so lots of great resident input um, to innovate around that as well. 
Um, and so the last thing I'll just touch on is the future. Um, we're going to continue to grow a little bit. As I talked about, we have uh, additional state funding. So we've added four residents per year um, over the last three years. And we'll do one more year to kind of come to our steady state of 16 Seattle Trek interns per year. Um, we are going to continue a lot of this continuous quality improvement that I highlighted, uh, I think really continuously focusing on how do we keep our curriculum up to date and really being, um, you know, helping to support the best education for the psychiatrists of the future, um, and really uh, that evaluation system being a foundational piece of that as well. We are also super excited about the new behavioral health teaching facility. I've had a lot of opportunities to really think about um, with the team that's designing this, how do we create spaces where uh, uh, interdisciplinary learning can happen, um, where we really um, can hopefully be teaching like, you know, best practices in psychiatric um, care for acute patient population. So I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities there as well. And then um, just a, like, uh, like a, a little um, teaser, um, we will have our accreditation self-study in 2024. Um, you will probably see more about that, but that is our um, every 10 years or so process where we go, re go through reaccreditation. So we are looking to think, start to think about how do we best present our program um, for that as well. So I will go ahead and stop there and stop sharing. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Dr. Ratzliff. Thank you, Dr. Lostutter, uh, for your, your joint presentation today. I'd, I'd like to encourage participants to write in questions or comments, and we can go through those now. Um, and as people are writing, perhaps just one comment, uh, really notable, I think, to me that uh, you've both presented on uh, a vision, future directions, things that are happening immediately and that you're working towards, all while uh, managing probably an, uh, a tremendous amount of day-to-day -day problems in the last year and a half, uh, figuring out how to do things differently very rapidly and still maintaining the focus and effort to plan out these uh, notable visions. And just in time, here's a question. Uh, what has the inpatient psychiatry training experience been through uh, the past year? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll talk a little bit of that. I mean, I think Ty talked, mentioned this, but I can go ahead. So um, so I think that that's probably referencing the fact that we no longer have inpatient training at um, UWMC here um, at Montlake on 7 North. Um, so the majority of the inpatient training has then been um, done at our other two sites. So, I mean, I think this is one of the places where it's really nice to have some redundancy within our system um, and some capacity to, to, to be nimble. Um, so a, a shout out to all the people who had to be nimble to help make that change happen. Um, and that really was, um, you know, mostly at Harborview because we have the most capacity there. It's our largest inpatient setting um, with some of those residents also at the VA. Um, I'm really excited this next year, actually, we will have our first intern, uh, sorry, residents up at, at Northwest. Um, we will have a geriatric inpatient rotation um, for second year residents, as well as a CL rotation. So I do think um, that will continue to evolve as, as the um, presence up at Northwest continues to evolve. Yeah, we too were trying to be, and I want to do a complete shout out to all those who've done inpatient work and were extremely, as, as Anna already said, nimble. Uh, it was quite a quick, rapid change of how we both uh, keep our residents safe, but still provide them good training opportunities. And that's what we really were focused on was safety first and then training opportunities second, but we were able to adapt. So when we did have inpatient that was still going on at Montlake, the resident actually, what was interesting to me was the resident went from seeing about two people in person to the fact that we had less team meetings, was able to see five or seven patients a day. So in some ways, the psychology resident got more time. Um, we are looking forward to when the new facility is being built. And I'm talking to Dr. Kimmel now about the possibilities of how we might be able to integrate psychology more into places in Northwest, but we are also trying to, the other thing that we have to have is supervisor rotations or supervisors of those sites to also provide supervision. So if anyone is currently wanting to do geriatric psychology supervision, give me a call because I've probably got residents for you. So, I, And a, another question came in uh, regarding the selection uh, or the residency being competitive. It sounds like uh, 
for psychology, it's all it's been the case that there's been 10 plus times the number of applicants, and that's the case for psychiatry now for several to many years. Is there a question about if that uh, increases risk of disparities in the selection process? It has the capacity. I'll answer to. <laughs> I was like, who, who doesn't have to get it if they answer that? Yeah. I will say, yes, the, it is true. I think we have been trying very hard, much like Anna, what we did. Um, the Diversity Advancement Committee this year met. They actually, every year I have the residents as well as faculty members go through. We looked and modified all of our questions that we were asking as kind of standardized questions. We changed all of our recruitment materials. We reviewed our criteria for what we were looking for as applicants and modified or uh, took out things that we thought in any way might create biases or anything like that. So we constantly are doing, I would say, qual what, what psychiatry calls quality improvement processes. I have learned lingo from, from my colleagues. Um, we are trying to modify that and use it on the psychology internship program. And I think that's what we have done using our diversity advancement committee to try to do that. Could we do more? Of course. Do I think it was a very, I will say that our next incoming cohort, not that I have data to completely do this, but is the most at least racially diverse group that we've had in quite some time. And we've been doing quite well over time around that. So we're trying to, we're keeping an eye on it but it's certainly a possibility. I do think moving to a virtual setting is probably going to help us in that area, in my opinion. Yeah, so, I mean, we've done a lot of work around thinking about potential bias, um, all kinds of biases in, in our recruitment process in this last, and I mean, I think that effort continued this last year. Um, uh, one of the things that is becoming more clear, you know, especially, in terms of resident um, selection is that there is a lot of potential bias in some of the, the, the things that we used to use as part of the assessment process, you know, and, and value pretty heavily. So things like scores on USMLE exams, there has, you know, been a lot of research in the last few years that has, has really focused on the fact that those probably have some racial bias within them, that the scores can actually be quite biased. And so one of the things that we've done to address that is to try to move to a more holistic um, evaluation of, of resident applicants and with that, I think, though, we've really had to be much more intentional, and it sounds like very similar to how Ty describes it, and being really clear about what is a good fit for, you know, like match an alignment with our program and who we best, you know, and who, what kind of residents um, really succeed here and thinking a lot about um, the kinds of um, uh you know, attributes, you know, more holistically, and how do we assess those out of the application materials we have? It's, it's a challenging problem. So I, I want to just name that when you're trying to do holistic evaluation across 1400 people, that's actually a really big challenge. Um, and one of the other things we've done is try to recruit more people to be part of that. So we can still keep that high standard of, you know, really taking time to assess the whole person um, as we're making those, those decisions to try to limit that risk. I, I didn't prepare either of you for this question, and it is only a minute and a half or so, but what kind of overlap is there in planning uh, between the two programs, given the overlap in trainees and clinical sites? I think, you know, I'll start and then maybe Ty can answer. I mean, I think that there is some, although I think there could be more. I mean, I think that that's, a, that's probably the fairest way to answer that question. I mean, I think there are some big challenges. You know, Ty has a one-year program and we have a four-year program, right? So what are the right residents to kind of pair up and think about, um, you know, having some more interaction is definitely something Ty and I actually have started to have some interesting conversations about. I think there are some places that are, um, residents interact naturally. So like on our inpatient settings, for example, they often share patients, some of our CL services. Um, we both have residents participate in the same DBT training um, effort. So there are some places where there, there's some sort of natural overlap. I'm really looking forward to how with the behavioral health teaching facility, we might be able to be even more intentional in designing the clinical services to reinforce that opportunity. So I'll, I'll pass it to Ty. 
Yeah, I think the same thing. And the other thing that I, I, I think partly I encourage it as supervisor and tra training director to encourage collaboration um, with residents in all of the different settings that uh, trying to figure out a way to strike up conversations, to talk about things. I do think that the in-person world makes it a little easier, a little more inviting to do so. So I do think virtually it's a little harder right now. Um, but I, I know that myself, like, uh, I was a practicum student on 7 North, and so working with a psychiatrist and getting along with the psychology residents and things like that, it's that it, it's the ability to, to be working on patients or cases together and talking from different perspectives has always been very useful and collaborative. And so I encourage that among our own residents. And again, I think as programs, we continue to try to figure out ways to do that. As we're coming out of the pandemic, there might also be the other thing that naturally works is social gathering. So again, when we are able to gather socially, I think that when people start to gather, they automatically find things that they have in common or ways. And I, I know a lot of my colleagues who are faculty members now talk closely about, and many of you have become my best friends, because we work together, right? It's side by side. And that also it helps us in a, as a program, I think, think about those things. So I'm looking forward to the pandemic finally being over to do those kind of social connections as well. Thank you both for, for uh, addressing the questions uh, in, in the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, well, we're right at one o'clock, uh, so we should end. I, I want to thank again, Dr. Ratzliff and Dr. Lostutter. Uh, both of whom could have presented on uh, their significant scholarly work outside of training programs, but uh, agreed to present on this, summarize the vision for the programs, share the time uh, to talk this over and present uh, to our group. So thank you again, and, and we'll uh, end there for today. Thank you, everyone.